Block six in Physics 100 covers the areas of impulse and momentum, and topic 6.1 introduces the impulse momentum theorem to us as a tool we can use for problem solving. What we want to do in this topic is first define the ideas of impulse and linear momentum. And you'll see over here in the equations on the right, the first equation describes impulse. Impulse I is a vector, and impulse is exerted by an external force here indicated by the subscript F vector AB, when that external force FAB acts on a system for a certain period of time over a time interval that begins at time T sub I and extends to time T sub F. So if we know what that external force is, and we can integrate that force with respect to time over this time interval, what that force does is exert an impulse on our system. Um, related to that is something called the linear momentum of the system. The linear momentum is a vector described by P, and the linear momentum of the system is equal to the mass of the system times the velocity of the system's center of mass. And if we have a, a system that's composed of a number of different objects, we can find the total linear momentum of that system of objects by multiplying the mass of each object by each object's velocity, then adding those mass times velocity terms together for each of the objects that make up the system. One of the things we want to do, as outlined in the second outcome, is calculate the impulse via direct integration for two-dimensional forces. So if we know this external force FAB that acts on a system, and maybe that force acts in a two-dimensional XY coordinate plane, we want to be able to perform this integral to determine the impulse that that force creates on our system. Something else we want to do is outlined by the learning outcome number three. We want to relate the average force associated with an impulse or a change in linear momentum to the time interval over which that average force occurs. So the last equation down here in the box describes this net average force that acts on a system in terms of the net impulse that force is able to exert on a system over a time interval delta t and the corresponding change in linear momentum the system might have over that time interval delta t. All of these ideas are tied together in what's defined by the fourth learning outcome, the impulse momentum theorem. And what the impulse momentum theorem states is here in this red equation, is that the net impulse that's exerted on a system by some type of external force can be found by adding up all the individual impulses that individual external forces create on a system. And all those impulses collectively have to give rise to a total change in the linear momentum of the system. That is called the impulse momentum theorem. And what we'll do in block number six is apply this idea to a number of different physics problems. What we can also do, as outlined in objective number or outcome number five, is relate the linear momentum of a system to its translational kinetic energy. And the first thing you want to note is that the momentum vector is a vector. And the magnitude of that vector is basically the mass of a system or an object times the system's speed, or the object speed. And so in terms of a magnitude, linear momentum P is just really a mass M times a speed V. And we can relate the translational kinetic energy of a system or an object, it's one half the mass times the speed squared, to the magnitude of the linear momentum squared divided by twice the mass of the object or the system. And so we've got that relationship between translational kinetic energy and the magnitude of the linear, linear momentum vector. And likewise, we can write the magnitude of the linear momentum vector in terms of the mass of the object and the translational kinetic energy of the object. And then to wrap things up, we want to discuss how we can use either the impulse momentum theorem or the work energy theorem to solve problems that don't require 
the critical use of Newton's laws of motion. So with that as a beginning, let's look at a warm-up question that basically asks the following. If two objects have the same non-zero momentum P, which of the following statements must be true? Do the objects have to have the same mass, or do they have to have the same velocity, or do they need to be traveling in the same direction, or must they have the same kinetic energy? Think about this. We'll pause the video and get back to you with the solution.